my goodness, it has been too long. What's up, guys? I'm Jay Zinski. Welcome back to the Banner Saga 2. In the last episode, we fought off a horde of dredge and had so many interactions, I can't even begin to count them, and it's been so long, I can't even remember half the stuff that happened. But I do remember that we fought off the dredge back down south with Alech, Juno, Hakon, Ivor, all those wonderful people. And we also discussed where we should go next, though we have to go through some place known as the Old Wood. It apparently gives Ivor and Hakon the creeps. Back up here in Vindal, we discovered that with the ravens, the guy that's the, well, the thing that's in the chest is in fact Bellower, the dredge leader from the last game and they've the falca the valka who is here uh told us that uh he's not dead definitely not dead he's just sleeping and the dredge are coming for him so we had to find a way to make him not an issue anymore but if you want to know more about what happened in the last episode please check it out it is going to be down in the description below but for now we are going to continue this journey today by going to check out the great hall first of all you choose a few ravens of the half that are around to join you on your investigation of the Great Hall. The front door might be the easiest, Folka says, but we could lift someone onto the roof and he'd be in, und in under an eave without trouble. You give it some thought. Uh, didn't realize you were the thieving type. Or, <coughs> sorry, didn't realize you were the thieving type. My family always worked hard for everything, so have I, Folke says. We gave almost everything to a Jarl who grew fat from never working. She looks at the Great Hall. I figure we'd take something from a place like this. We probably earned it somehow. Right or wrong, she believes what she says. Fine, we'll try your way. Mogan, you're up. You practically toss the man onto the snow-covered roof, and he slips a few times before making it under an eave. Time passes without any sign from him, but one of the ravens warns you that a group is coming at the front. Let's go, you order, and all of you return to the raver's post, minus Mogan. A short time later, you're surprised by who approaches. Uh, good Munder and his guards march up with a half-dozen bound ravens. Your birds were trying to take things from the Great Hall that don't belong to them, he says. You say nothing. You and your fighters could have really helped us today, says the guard captain, but you don't do anything without payment. In different times, I'd have killed these pathetic thieves, but we need fighters for what's coming. He looks at you. We should all get to the mines. At the mine, Mogan rejoins you. Had to hide until everyone cleared out, he says. Hopefully this sets us straight for the whole cart issue, huh? He hands you something before entering the mine. Some piece of gear, I guess. Oh, yes, yeah, so we have to go down to this mine. Oh, my God, this is wild. The little map going down into the mountain. Oh, that's crazy. The mine shaft is cramped, and more than once your broken horns knock against the rough ceiling or a timber. You follow Valka Zephyr at the head of the caravan. She's lighting one of the many bracketed torches along the way when shouts from the mouth of the mine reach you. Dredge! The gates in the town did nothing to halt their advance. Oh, yeah, we're, we're fleeing through the mines. Good Munder and his men will slow them, Zephyr says, but it may not be enough. They have orders to collapse the opening if they're overwhelmed. Will you keep them from being overwhelmed? Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, I, I'm going to try to roleplay this, and I definitely don't think um, would he would do this without pay. So we're mercenaries, not volunteers, and no price will cover the cost of us all dying in this mine shaft, she says. I'll head back there if you won't, but if I die up there, she looks at you. The torches will burn out, the food will run out, and then the real horror will start. Ah, we'll do it, but we'll talk price later. Yes, we will, she says. We need to talk about many things. You turn and shout, Ravens, back to the top! Heading up the mine shaft is like swimming against a current. Frightened villagers push forward, and you barely have enough room to get past the yawks and cart. Goodmunder, in his grim manner, looks pleased to see you. No real plan, he says. Just kill as many as you can. The ravens around you smile at his words and begin to chant. What a way to start an episode. All right, let's get our uh, guys in order and then we'll go kill them. Let's see if I can remember how to fight this. Play this. What is that gluey thing standing watch of the stone singers? This thing? Gloom Warden. Oh my goodness. 
Sh covers all dredge of the mouth with the volatile spikes that shatter on any impact. That's disgusting. I don't like that at all. Goodmunder is up first. I'm just going to get him in the fight immediately. There's the Gloom Warden. Oh my god! He's... He hurts. Sigmar, so just make him a lot weaker. Please. Oh, Goodmunder's about to go down. I'm. It's... He's not going to last long. Zephyr, what can you do? Screw it. Just throw a rune of power down. I don't know what's going to do for us, but... Oh, increases. Okay, this is going to increase things for us. Uh, Echo, do not let him do whatever he's doing. Oh, he's going to keep doing it. Damn. All right, Bulwark. Um, just uh, go wild, I guess, man. This is nutty. This is like really bad for us right now. But Sigbjorn can spin to win. Go, Sigbjorn! Uh-oh. These are, this is not my dream team. So I don't think we're gonna do really well here. Sigbjorn's still up. So is Echol. We still got a good chance at this. Oh, Oli's going down. Yep, there goes Oli. But you're going down with him. Bam! So did she? Oh my goodness gracious, guys. Yeah, good strike there. Yeah, there it goes. Uh, I can't remember anyone's names. Ah! We threw out his name! All right. And then it's pillage time for Echo and Sigmuren. Echo and Sigmuren are like our striker. No, please, no! No, there's only two of us left! Okay, thank goodness. Fall back, Gudman repeats. Gudmunda repeats. The opening is ready to come down. As everyone sprints into the mine, the guard captain tosses you a heavy hammer and points at a timber. You deserve the honor, he says. You turn and look at the gray sky, the snow, Bindle, and the dredge walking toward you. With a hefty swing, the timber snaps and the rocks begin to fall. You drop the hammer and race down the shaft toward the light of the torches. Alrighty. So they won't be able to follow us. And then it darkens up there. That's cool. Ahead, the path comes to a dead end against the smooth surface of a large, flat rock. We should camp, Zephyr says. It may be the last decent sleep these people get for days. I'll need Nichols to assist me in opening the path beyond. But first, you and I should talk. About what? Ooh, camp. All right. I'm going to talk to her first before we camp. A few small fires provide a sense of calm for the caravan, though the villagers keep well away from the ravens. There is enough light to see you are no longer in a man-made mine, but a natural cave of sorts. What are we doing down here? Staying alive and keeping Bellower from the dredge. I thought that was obvious, but we keep heading down like we're hunting dwarves. The Valka gives you a ghost of a smile. Until today, no one but a few on the council knew about these tunnels, not even Mendos. We didn't create them, but we have used them a great deal over the years to travel far distances quickly. Zephyr becomes quiet, awaiting a question. Where do they lead? Practically everywhere. Arborang, Vo, Grofheim, or what is left of it. I'm not sure anyone knows the full extent of these underground paths, but we are about to enter a corridor, one of the main tunnels. Zephyr becomes quiet, awaiting a question. So where are we headed? Where would you go, knowing you possess the sleeping body of the immortal Sunder General? Uh... Bloody Manahar? Manahar is the safest place to secure Bellower's body. Whatever drew the dredge army toward us and Bindal, the council can find a way to stop it. Manahar, I guess, is... Um, where all the Mander, the Mander Council is, I guess. And what about my ravens? So far, helping Valka pays less than a bloodshed coin. And that is why I'm talking to you alone now. Corridor will lead us to Manahar in a week's time. See us there safely, and I will give you a genuine Valka oath. 
You will be rewarded well enough to never need work again. You look around the cave walls and back the way you came. We'll go to Manaha. We were heading there after the Blue River anyway. Alrighty, crazy, crazy stuff. Let's rest. Uh, we'll do two days of rest. And then we need to go. We have a week's worth of supplies. Well, we have more than a week's worth, but you know, something's gonna happen on the way there. In the light of the torches, everyone is covered in soot and dirt. They smell bad too. It comes as no surprise when the sound of running water excites the caravan. It has to be some underground river or something, a woman says, and all the villagers start moving that direction. Uh, I'll push ahead of everyone. With large strides, you clamber over slick rocks and get in front of the others. You stop at the sight of long blades of pale grass blowing as if on a windy plain. But there is no wind. The sound is just like running water. It's just up here, a young man says, rushing past you. Vines lash out like whips from beneath the grass and grab the man's legs, sinking thorns deep into his skin. You reach for him, but his body falls lifeless almost instantly. A few more cracks of the vines sound out down the row. Get back, you roar, and everyone obeys, falling back to the path. This is terrible, Zephyr says, taking the deaths personally. We should stick to the paths as much as possible. Too much can go wrong down here. The faces of those passing you are frightened. Uh, that's some creepy stuff down here. Um, hello. The man's sudden appearance makes you tense. I didn't mean to sneak up on you. It's something I do. I mean, something I've learned to do. Something that will get you killed if you do it to me again. Under... Okay, yes, understood. But it does have its uses. Just allow me to fight alongside you in a... Well, a fight. You won't regret it. Dutch or ditch. We'll call him Dutch. You scoff and turn away from the man only to see Gudmunder approach. I see you made Dutch. Strange fellow to have next to you in a fight. But he finds his way through enemy defenses. Then you fight next to him. People near me tend to get hurt. But his injuries won't be an accident. Jesus, Pulverk. He's, he's so intense. I love him. He's so different from Alette. What's going on here? You hear Valka ask a group of ravens. They're standing around a whimpering man on his knees. You kept whining about being hungry, one of your fighters says. We found these little glowing berries for him, but suddenly he's not so hungry. Knock the berries out of his hand. Cut it out, you growl. Next time I'll make you eat whatever it is. You yank the man to his feet and he runs off to join his people. You give no thought to his glowing footprints as he stomps through the berries. I don't trust anything down here. Though torches highlight the craggy black rocks and puddles on the path underfoot, they do little to keep everyone together. Sharp turns around boulders quickly block lines of sight. We've lost a few families, Zephyr informs you. We need to stop and find them. This is the only time. I appreciate the help, she says, and splits everyone into search groups. As you search, you realize it's just as hard to track time down here as it's above with a sun that never moves. Sometime later, you think you hear voices to the left. Uh, I'll call out to the left. Using a softer voice than usual, you call out. You there? A moment later, you hear a response. Ooh, there? The voice sounds like yours, but different. Hmm. Search in the direction of the response. As you move for away from the main path, you leave someone with a torch standing every so often. This route proves useless as it seems you must have heard nothing but an echo. You follow the lion torches back to the path. Then we'll keep searching down the path. A bit further down, you find the source of the sounds. A mother is holding her children, tucked away in the recess of the rock formation. She whimpers as you approach, and Fulka says, Better let me handle this. Moments later, you all head back to meet with Zephyr. Surprisingly, all the missing clansmen were found. Woo! Awesome. And the clansmen got some forage. Nice. All right. Water barrels are running low. Holfi, your quartermaster reports, and I'll be damned if I start licking these slimy rocks for a drink. The shield maiden looks at you. If these people start getting desperate for water down here, you cut her off. I know, you say. 
Send out some scouts. We'll camp here until they return. Some of your ravens and other members of the caravan group up and grab torches, rope, and water skins before heading off in different directions. Better catch some rest while you can, Folka says. Nothing to do until they get back anyway. Laying down, you focus on the sound of a small drip somewhere in the cave. It grows louder, like the beat of a drum. Like thousands of feet marching behind you. You turn, and everyone stops. You see the glowing eyes of your army looking at you in admiration. A hundred members break formation to dig holes in the cavern floor and place stone bowls in the depressions. The bowls quickly fill with water, and the first is offered to you. You slake your thirst before seeing your red-armored reflection in the bowl. You wake up with a shout, and Folko joins you. What was it this time? I... Dreamt I was asunder. I led an army of dredge through here. They they respected No, they liked me. The shield maiden has no response. Some of the other scouts return with some water, others simply don't return. Damn. A rope bridge with wooden planking crosses an open span in the cavern formations. Looks old, Falka says. Narrow and not meant for carts. Well then, we'll get the menders to reinforce it. Both Zephyr and Nichols move through the crowd and begin tracing patterns in the air with their staves. The only thing you see is a slight lift in the bridge, but they walk across the first to calm any fears the caravan crosses without incident. See? They're good for something. This cave is creepy as hell. Oh boy, what's going to happen? Usually we don't zoom in like this unless something's about to happen. I'm really curious. I didn't think we, like, I didn't think this would happen. I've slept in caves like this for entire winters. But there's something about this place. Something old. Unfamiliar. I don't like it. But I don't like all these humans on the verge of panic either. Maybe these dwellings up ahead will calm them down. I love how I just continuously get the voices of these characters wrong. <laughs> Is that a godstone? I think it is. I think that's a godstone. Zephyr looks up at the giant shaped formation, glittering with strange, glowing patterns. The Valka know almost nothing about this ancient race's culture, let alone their god, Veznan. The name alone might be wrong, but we have a framework of letters based on repeated patterns found around here. She wanders around the glowing pools of the godstone. If we are correct, Veznan was not their only god, but he became one of the most powerful at the cost of everything dear to him. She looks at you. Of course, if what you hold dear is something like control, maybe there is power in letting go. Gems of various size and shape are found and embedded in the surrounding stones. The clansmen are soon hammering away in an attempt to pry a particularly large gem loose. The ringing of hammers echoes through the deep. Uh, I'll try my luck at prying one out. You push a man aside and start working your hands at the stone. As you tile, you get more and more furious at the stone, and the men's baleful eyes on you cause you to start shouting at them. You're soon sweating and frothing at the corners of your mouth. Are the others laughing at you? Giggles from children cause you to spin about, changing their expressions to fear. Laughing at me? You hit the stone until your fists are bloody and your vision just as red. The gem shatters with a loud crack, and the stone splinters around it. Folka throws her shield over several children, but a chunk of stone hits her in the nose hard enough to break it. Ugh. As the dust settles, you feel exhausted. The clansmen stare at you with fear in their eyes. Zephyr tends to the wounded, completely ignoring you. And we made a giant fool of ourselves, of course. Let's, um... 
I guess we'll talk to these, some of these guys we don't know who they are. Nichols first. That's Zephyr's uh, young apprentice. The young mender stands tall and proud as you approach. Bolvark, I was thinking, well, wondering, about what it takes to become a raven. I've never heard stories about a test or trials to join. Is there a test? Why do you care? Aren't you Zephyr's lackey? Well, apprentice, yes. I'm a full mender training to become a Valka. Part of our training requires world experience. Couldn't you work for a blacksmith or something? Oh man, that's where I broke her nose, I think. Nichols frowns at her. Would you kill someone for coin? Kill for... The mender's face pales a bit. I mean, I guess, if that was the job. Volka walks up and clamps a hand on one of Nichols' now sagging shoulders. Most of what we do never makes it into the Scald songs. I guess I need to think on this a bit more. Let us know in Manahar. Nichols nods as you walk off. So he wants to become a raven. Well, it's not, it's not a cool thing to be. <laughs> Talk to the spear guy. The spearman is standing alone, staring off into the depths of the caves. If you take off down one of those tunnels, we're not going after you. Bach doesn't respond. He doesn't want to talk. I like him already. Do you know the worst part about it all? Never mind, I don't like him. <laughs> no. Worst part of what? Of everything. This world. This life. If you can call it that. What a Debbie Downer. It's the silence. You give Folka a look. He hasn't slept near Oli. That man makes all kinds of strange sounds. That's just noise. There's a silence from the loneliness. Folka inhales sharply. He's hit a sore spot. Maybe these tunnels and caves makes it worse. There used to be days of talk. We used to laugh. Are you talking about your feigned spear again? Buck turns and stares at you with the eyes of a man undecided on going mad. Lofen helps where she can, but no, there was another. Now there's an endless hole shaped like her. If I don't keep feeling it with work or drink, he walks away without finishing his thought. Keep an eye on him. I'm the only one who gets to lose their mind and start killing. He's not crazy. He's alone. Whoever she was, he still thinks she was the greatest. I'm jealous of her. It would be nice to have someone feel that way about me. You shake your head, snort, and walk away. Faint humans. <laughs> That's how I read it anyway. <laughs> oh, goodness. Are right, we going to rest one more day? Let's check out these pools. This was a sacred sanctuary for those who built it, the Valka says. Walking around the perfectly round, rippling pools. At least, from what we have uncovered. The top pool was for reflecting on one's deeds. The middle, to ask for strength from the world. And the bottom pool was for insight into one's future. She hesitates before saying, I've never done anything but study their inscriptions. Look ahead with the bottom pool. Discovering the future before it happens sounds promising. You sit in front of the bottom pool, searching its surface before cupping the water in your hands. It turns green, but you drink it anyway. Suddenly, your head and body thrums with pain, like you've been savagely beaten. Gasping for air, you sense a great foreboding presence arched over you, staring. Your beard and chest are covered in the green water. Inside, you feel a single, burning desire to hunt someone who has taken everything from you. I've been there before, Oli says, waking you from your dream. You drink the wrong stuff, or too much of the right stuff, and you're on your back before you know it. You notice each of the pools has gone dark, but the pain you experienced lingers. Why? Let's philosoph let's, let's, let's theorycraft here for a minute. Why is Bulwark having so many weird feeling connections to Bellower? What, what's going on there? Like... Is Bellower's consciousness seeping into his mind, or is there is there something else at work? I don't know. It makes me uneasy. 
but um we're gonna we're gonna press on and and, and find out.